we'll begin and we'll just go down the line. Perfect. Oh, you get a mic. We were, we were trying on this end of the table to get the talking started on that end of the table. But I guess I'd, I'd do two things. One, I'd say I'm grateful uh, to have been here for so many very impressive talks. Um, by very, you know, and reflecting that by people, very impressive people with um, remarkably valuable points of view. I say things like that because I always start things by throwing a couple mild bombs. So I'm going to throw a mild bomb here and say, I was sitting here uh, this morning, listening to Phil, listening to Phil, um, and nodding my head as I went along. I thought it was a right-on kind of view, point of view. I appreciated especially his discussion of the family's place in the neighborhood. Amen. And so then I heard him say, in summary, so the world is a desert compared to what we have. And then I'd say, and that hit the brakes for me. And so I thought I would put that on the table in a certain sort of way. It's right to observe that the world is not exactly the church, but it's God's world. Let me stipulate at the beginning of this. We live in a fallen world. We are fallen people. Um, we, th we know the medicine. However, there's a danger, especially in this kind of project, of assuming that it's a binary world. I'll, I'll go even further and say, the Archbishop used the image of an eclipse to talk about secularism. I don't think, with respect, that's right. The world outside the church is a mixed world. It's broken, it's separated, but there are wonderful things in the world. There's, there are truths in the world, and that's what there is for us to build on. It's the capacity of a seven or eight year old neighbor kid to recognize the truth that he brings with him from the outside. So our interactions shouldn't be fearful or dominated. They should be careful, but I'll put, this in, I'll put this in another kind of way. We're in the church, we are citizens of another country, but we're citizens of this country too. We love our communities, we love the nations, we find good in them, and there is good in them. What we're talking about is finding the full goodness. And when we take to the world an attitude which periodically says to them, well, by the way, you're in the desert, we don't mainly mean, oh, and the desert blossoms, which is what we really mean. And so we have to be careful about how we talk to ourselves and to the world as if, there were, as if it were a binary circumstance. You will hear Orthodox people say it's a binary circumstance. I'm not there. You heard desert? I said dessert. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's nothing but frosting. I don't want you to go up. I know. Good try. I'm sorry. Oh, try. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, there, there's just a lot and my sense about this these few days is there's a lot and I want to echo in my mind just the head nodding it's nice to there's a real value in hearing the faith proclaimed and to ourselves um, there's a part of me that doesn't want to say anything because my brain is full and my heart is full and there's another part of me that does want to agree with you that you know, and I see this in parenting, and I see this in the home, that it really is easy to get into a somehow us against them, a good versus bad, a how are we the, the elect and the unelect, and um, really that really flies in the face of, I think, reality and of love. So I do feel like America is a, a wasteland and a desert, because orthodoxy is young here, but I like your image. That doesn't mean there are no flowers, and, and we're part of it. So I think... I think it really is an invitation. I think it's an invitation to, to be who we are and become who we're called to be. And to be honest, the, the biggest challenge I think I have found in speaking to secular America is the challenge of, in my own soul and my own heart, just becoming who I'm called to be. And it seems like the more I focus on that and just am attentive to who's around me, my neighbor, I think everything really goes from there. I think the problem comes in is when we stop doing that, when we stop being who we're called to be. And I think we need to speak up against things that we're doing that is not in our identity. We don't need to do something new. We need to change some habits that have crept in that are really different than our identity. And it's an, it's an act for our own salvation, um, and it's an act of love. So 
That's it. Um, oh, gee, there's been the Jimi Hendrix effect here. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> it's a cross. It's your cross. Oh, okay. I don't know. It's my cross. <laughs> yes. Don't hide it. Don't hide it. Okay. Yes. I don't know what to do. So, when my family and I had been eight, uh, Orthodox for 18 months or so, my oldest daughter uh, went to Russia to work on her language. She was majoring in Russian in college in Alabama, which is really exciting. And um, she used her scholarship to go to Krasnoyarsk, which is 12 time zones away and about as deep in Siberia as you can get. And uh, I remember we would talk once a week on the phone and uh, she'd been there a couple of months or so. She says, you know, Papa, you know, she said, uh, the priest here, he says the same things you do, which actually made me feel really good because I was still seriously doubtful about my ability to say the right thing. But I said, well, of course, dear, we're Orthodox, you know, in the sense that you can be 12 time zones away in a culture just about as absolutely not America as possible. Um, and yet the priests say the same thing. I have some sense about that about this week is that how much consensus there is. Um, uh, first off, that uh, we didn't have a speaker who says there's no problem. <laughs> um, and a great deal, a great deal of overlapping and synergy in the talks and conversation. And I think some of that says um, orthodoxy is, uh, you know, is working. Um, differences, and yet here we are. To go back to the, what was earlier said, though, I see this bumper sticker that says orthodoxy since 33, I founded 33 AD, and I go, no, no, no. Orthodox begins with let there be light. That uh, it's, Paul says in the first chapter of Ephesians that God has purpose to gather together in one all things in Christ Jesus. That is the fullness of the Orthodox vision is that. And I mentioned about sort of being a priest in Walmart or wherever else. I, I think it's very important to me. I think of myself as the priest of my town. That is my job. I am as called to everyone in that city as the ones who are in. Uh, I am their priest. Uh, most of the city uh, hasn't yet gotten to communion. You know, and that's something to be done, but that doesn't change anything at all about who I am to them. Um, and someone mentioned that I was a hospice chaplain for a couple of years, and when I first converted, that's sort of how I made my living. And so I was taking care, I'm mostly Baptist and Pentecostals, and even the Baptists weren't Southern Baptists, that was too city-fied. Uh, but I got to know and to love those people that are the people of Appalachia. Uh, and had a blessing from the bishop to do funerals, whatever I needed to do. Um, and I was their priest. They, I remember visiting one woman who was a uh, member of uh, the Primitive Baptist Church, and they don't allow musical instruments. And she said, we ain't got musical instruments in our church. I said, we don't have them in mine either. And uh, I thought, I bet she thinks I'm Church of Christ. But, uh, <laughs> you know, but um, it's... But I think there's, there's a right inclusivity for us to have. We are not binary. Uh, there, uh, one, 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 one is a consistent message of the gospel. The church is one just as God is one, just as the empire should be one, it, you know, <laughs> all of that. Um, and that's, we should have that vision. Um, and, and therefore, you know, I, my, I've got adult children now. They're youngest of 24 of my four. And sometimes they're with me and sometimes they're not. You know, they've got issues and stuff. But they're my children. How is that different from anybody in my community? they got issues too. And they got good reasons for their issues, but they're still mine. You know, and if they're mine, then they're yours. And, and I think that's, you know, secularism, as I said, is a heresy. In some ways, it's a disease but I dare not treat it as the natural state of the world. It's a passing thing, and these are all God's people. Hmm. So, anyway, that's my thought, for what it's worth. 
Well, I, my biggest takeaway uh, is that, you know, I come uh, with the perspective of a parish priest who feels all the time my imperfection and, and the imperfection of my own parish and uh, certainly my metropolis and my archdiocese and the Orthodox Church. And uh, so to come to a conference like this, and I want to I wanna thank you very much, Father Luke. And I know this isn't the first conference. This is just one in many. This is just part of an ongoing conversation. But it's the first one that I've been a, a part of. And uh, I want to thank all of you speakers and, and also John Mark, who had to fly out, because I was incredibly enriched and humbled. And uh, I was very much encouraged by your participation and, and, and the fact that you come from many places and many jurisdictions. I was very impressed and encouraged by the students and their interest and their presence consistently in all the talks. Obviously yesterday you did not have school, but today there was school. And, and to see people going to their classes or even missing their classes for the sake of something important or running from class to come here and, and having been a student, I, I know very well how stretched thin you are. And oftentimes, you know, conferences for a student, because they aren't always necessarily about something you may be interested in, is a burden. And I didn't, I didn't get that sense at all. Uh, from you and and knowing that Father Chris and I've known him a long time and just before he was actually a, a elected as the president spoke to our metropolis clergy lady about the ministry of OCN but it really wasn't about OCN it could have very well have been one of these talks and contributed greatly to what was said here because it just expressed the mission-mindedness of Father Chris. And I said, I am so thankful as I, as, I, as I was listening to him that he was on that short list and it just seemed to me that it was gonna be God's will that he be chosen as the next president. Because of the role this school, a seminary, plays in the fabric of the church and its future. And uh, to be a part of Father Luke's classes and to be a part of of the, uh, the mission committee it was very, very encouraging. It, it shows to me that the church, imperfect as it is, not in its theology, not as an ecclesial body, but us, we as people, the members, that, that we're, 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 we're trying to address this issue. It's not like society is static and we're just not doing anything about reaching out. That's far from the truth. The, the society is changing at such an exponentially rapid rate that it may seem like we're not caught up and doing what we need to be doing. But change is slow. And, and I, I really appreciated uh, what Father John said, because he said it a few times, that in our own personal spiritual lives and in the life of the church, we have to take the long view. Doesn't mean we don't push and, and, and challenge and take that self-critical look, but we still have to take the long view. And, and this conference for me uh, sends me back with tremendous hope, tremendous encouragement, um, a lot of practical and, and better understanding of, of the challenges that we face, and I'm, I'm, de I'm deeply appreciative of it. And uh, it, it, it gives me great motivation and enthusiasm to go back and continue the work in our area. <laughs> You're going to begin to think I was planning those kinds of things. <clears throat> I'm tempted to start singing, start spreading the news, because I've rarely held a microphone like this in my hand. <laughs> and that's an evangelistic song, except for it's about leaving. Um, I did find the quotation I was, I was mentioning earlier by St. Ignatius of Antioch. I'm, I'm afraid that in my, in my short, um, you know, irresponsible use of technology while my neighbor was talking, forgive me brothers, 
I did want to read it to you, <clears throat> at least in this longer form. It says this, that is why it is proper for your conduct and your practices to correspond closely with the mind of the bishop. And this indeed they are doing. Your justly respected clergy, who are a, a credit to God, are attuned to their bishop like the strings of a harp. And the result is a hymn of praise to Jesus Christ from minds that are in unison and affections that are in harmony. Pray then, come and join this choir, every one of you. This is the point. Let there be a whole symphony of minds in concert. Take the tone all together from God and sing aloud to the Father with one voice through Jesus Christ so that he may hear you and be known by your good works that you are indeed members of his son's body. That's such a beautiful image and I, I reiterate very basically that same, same message that we've also already reiterated again here at these tables. Um, I would also like to add that a conference such as this, thank you again Father Luke, is um, only part of it is this. Um, I appreciated very much the three hours a day that we spent in the refectory together, where we could sit at different tables with different people and really get to, to meet remarkable people from across the North America. There's at least one person here from Canada, so that makes this an international conference, <laughs> and, um, and others uh, who are doing similar work and have beautiful stories, all of which are inspiring to go back to our own home places and say, and share that uh, great news with those who have been around. So a conference is only, I, I don't know, dare I would even say that 25% of the conference is the talks, even though they occupied 80% of our together time or something like that. But the value of meeting one another, learning about various ministries that are going on across the church, that's beautiful and to make those connections on, the, on a seminary campus and to pray in church together, to sing hymns together. Uh, this is what the church does. So thank you for arranging all of that. I want to thank all our speakers. I want to thank all of you for just addressing this very relevant topic. Uh, one thing that I heard from numerous people, they came up to me and said, you know, thank you for putting together this topic because it's such a relevant topic which all of our churches need to address. And in one small way, we're trying to offer some thoughts for all of us to take back to our churches. And what inspired me was, number one, despite looking at certain statistics, when I heard a talk a couple weeks ago, the future without a church, uh, will the future have a church? And the, the, the talk that I heard and the statistics that were given left me quite depressed. The talk, the talk wasn't meant to be depressing, but just the statistics left me depressed. Listening to Dr. Walsh explain statistics and then give his own version of them, it painted a little bit of a different picture. But what I was inspired by was to realize whatever the changes are that are happening in our society, the gospel doesn't change, Jesus Christ doesn't change, the church doesn't change. And if we truly act as the church, if we truly strive in our own lives, and that's a th common theme we heard again and again, our answer to secularism is, number one, living our faith, practicing our faith as much as we can in whatever fallen way, whatever with all the weaknesses that we have, First and foremost, if we live our faith and offer that witness with our lives, but then not only doing that, being conscious in reaching out to the entire world, whoever they are, the nuns, the duns, the apathetic, whoever they are, to reach out in love, not in judgment, not in condemnation, but in love, um, to reach out, and then to try to create communities that will offer something that everyone wants a community of love, a community where God's grace is felt, his presence is experienced, his truth is proclaimed. Um, so it's a challenge. Many of our churches aren't places like that. But it's a challenge that we, we all need to go back and strive to do our part in living more faithfully and then in trying to challenge our communities to be better witnesses of God's presence. So again, I want to thank all the speakers and thank all of you. I'm sure we all have a lot to 
digest and to carry home with us and to reflect on. Like I mentioned before, all of the talks we're going to try to get up as soon as we can on our Missions Institute website, www.missionsinstitute.org, so that the talks will be on there. We're hoping that OCN will also put the links on OCN, so it will be available there. And then I'm also hoping to get the written text of each of these talks and offer them, and we're going to try to publish them um, through either a magazine or in a book form. But we want these talks to be available for all of us to reflect on it even more. We can conclude with one or two questions in general, if, if anyone has any questions that anyone at the table can answer. Um, this is a question for anyone. Um, I work as a youth director uh, in the uh, New York City metro area. And it's, I would say, quintessential secular area. And so it's faith and religion in that area is very much put over in this corner of your life. So when you need a baptism, when you need a wedding, or if you need to go to church that Sunday or something. Um, and if sports comes in the way, sports takes the, the priority, these kind of things. Um, so as a youth director who doesn't have kids, so I can't live out my orthodoxy for showing what family life looks like, um, what would you recommend for a single youth director working with youth in a secular area and how to inspire living out orthodoxy when oftentimes their families aren't living out orthodoxy? It's always better to know what the truth is than to pretend it's something else. If we're, if we're starting down here, we're starting down here. Um, the good news about the, the, uh, the larger number of people who say they're nuns and it's a limited truth is that they're telling the truth about their reality. And that's where our job starts all the time. Um, it, uh, there are a whole series about how we perceive people who don't agree with us and how we get into conversation with them. And a lot of the us we, it, a lot of the us we don't have, which there are people like yours who are halfway in. That not only now but throughout history has been a normal thing. The church has always struggled with the half-hearted. Um, and we don't say they don't have salvation. Right? We say, what is it? We're on the way. That's, that's what our faith is. We start there. And, you know, I, I think that you'd have to go to, to, to our Dr. Phil. Um, nice. And, and he undoubtedly has a better answer than that one. But I think that's where it starts. <coughs>
that kind of thing can maybe be a baby step in, in a direction. Just an idea. Um, one topic that, oh, I'm sorry, Father, you Just a little bit, just a little bit. Uh, the other thing, I mean, I think, remember we talked about hearing over and over again the long view? In the short run, keep doing what you're doing and maybe add like like articles that could be addressed to the family. But in the long view, I, I think we still have to try with the with the parish priest and the other ministries that are an extension of youth ministry to address the parents and and not to give up on that. Okay, it's not it's not like you can click your finger and and, and, and make huge inroads right away, especially if it's if it's uh, if it requires much more than you because you only can control what you can control, but you certainly can influence as a youth director to make youth work much more focused on the whole family unit rather than separating the youth from the the relationship with the parents, and and, and I just say you know chip away at it to. And, and be the cause of, of a more holistic change in that way because you're, you're, if you're only partnering with the parents and you're building them up in the faith and the priest in the parish is building them up in the faith, it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to bear a hundredfold more fruit than, than you're able to do by yourself. Okay, so our final question and final response of the conference. Thank you all for all well, this has been a fantastic, fantastic conference. Um, one topic that never really came up um, it's very related, but you know, maybe a topic for a future conference maybe is uh, the fact that an increasing number of those who have left a nominal Christian background are looking into things like Buddhism, Hinduism, Sufism, Wicca. You mentioned the the, the young lady, the young girl who's interested in Wicca, um, and in my experience, uh, there's not that much out there from the Orthodox perspective speaking towards those people. There's lots speaking towards Protestants, speaking towards Roman Catholics, uh, but those people who are still really part of the secular world who, you know, they read some Dalai Lama, they you know, read about Zen, and then they like that stuff and they like that part of their life. Uh, how do, do you have any experience speaking to that segment of the secular world? And uh, uh, any thoughts on how to respond? Hmm. In uh, Santa Fe, New Mexico, there's an Antiochian parish where Father uh, John Betancourt is the priest. And I was out there a couple of years ago, and earlier the day, the day I got there, they had just baptized the leader of the Buddhist community in Taos. New Mexico. So it is happening. Uh, and we talked about it because he said most of the population out there is spiritual but not religious and, and typically something funky. And, you know, there's lots of ex hippies and stuff who. Uh, and actually, we, we, uh, we blend in well with hippies. Uh, some of us do. And, uh, you know, uh, and in fact, you know, in, in the OCA, when we brought in the guys from Christ Our Savior Brotherhood, it was like this huge influx of hippie priests and uh, who had a deep, deep uh, community experience and all of that. And actually, we learned a lot, and they've contributed a great deal to the life of the community. I, I think um, it's, I don't think we have, to, we should think in programs. Um, there was a saying in a movement I was involved in in the Episcopal Church of make a friend, be a friend, bring a friend to Christ. And, um, you know, why should anybody do anything if they don't think I love them? And uh, so I, I, just, I, I think, you know, find ways to make friends in those communities. I, your, your coffee stuff, uh, one of our most successful uh, evangelistic priests in the OCA has a a line item budget, I mean, a line item in his budget for lunches. And he the, he just evangelized, I mean, I think he had like seven former Protestant pastors in his congregation. Father Ted, yes. he's just serious. But he'll take you to lunch, which is, you just, it's over. Uh, he'll take you to lunch. And, uh, yeah, and so, um, but he really practices that. In a, in a way, I think it's always a um, a temptation for us to go program because we want to do lots of folks, you know, but 
and you can cast a net in some circumstances and get things, but an awful lot of our fishing has got to be fly fishing, and you know, kind of oh, one man, on brother. one, and uh, you know, they add up after a while. But it just, yeah, tie the fly. Yeah. I mean, yeah. If, if you want a piece of encouraging statistical information, half of the people who say they grew up unaffiliated have affiliated with some religious group. Doesn't mean with us. That's the work, but it's not a closed door. Yeah, it's not a closed door. Very good. May I ask your grace to come up at this a closing prayer? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. O Christ, our God, the source of all blessings, we join our hearts in a prayer of thanksgiving to you for the blessings of this conference. Guide those who have been our speakers. Enlighten those who have learned Give safe travel to the participants as they return to their homes. Entrust to them the joy of their families and the blessings of their communities where they live and serve. We offer thanks for this institution which has found the joy and the strength and the means to bring us together in this conference of glorification and thanksgiving to you, together with your Father who is from everlasting, and your all holy good and life-giving spirit, now and forever and to the ages of ages. Amen. Amen. May I make a comment? Our Lord needed for evangelists to proclaim his gospel. We needed seven speakers, seven gospels. But what is common to the gospels of our Lord and to our presenters, even seven in number, is that they all bring the same message. And as we say in our Orthodox theology, diversity in unity and unity in diversity. The diversity of the messages brought us to the unity of the faith that we share, and we are thankful for that. Thank you again, everyone, for your attendance, participation, and God bless you, safe travels.